So hello once again to another episode of the 286 Project. My name is Chris Akers and on here we always talk about art, culture, sports, politics and everything else we can think of. Today's guest is Dr. Danny Fitzpatrick, who's a lecturer in uh, politics and international relations. Um, hi Danny, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Hi Chris. Hi there. Um, so the reason I invited you on was because I want to discuss with you sports and politics because mm -hmm. There's been this mix and a bit of the two and that seems to have grown over the last few years. But before we get into history of it, if you'd like to introduce yourself, um, how you got to where you got to um, and what is your speciality in this subject? Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks, Chris. So, as you said, I'm a, a lecturer in uh, politics and international relations at Aston University in Birmingham uh, in the UK. And uh, I suppose, how did I get into research and the politics of sport or sport and politics. Um, no, it wasn't kind of completely by accident. So my background was really in public policy and governance. So my um, PhD was actually on regulation. So uh, UK regulation, particularly focusing on the privatised utilities, telecommunications and the energy sector. Um, so I was thinking about regulation and, and I, I was a, a big kind of sports fan, particularly a football fan. And I kind of grew more interested in looking at the regulation of sports and how sport was governing, governed and the role of the state or the absence of the role of the state in terms of how sport was managed. Because one thing I noticed was kind of over, certainly over the 20th century, certainly post-war, post-1945, post the state gradually took more responsibility for the governance of different areas of the economy and society um, and, and either took direct ownership, and, and you know, in the case of nationalised utilities, or had a kind of an oversight regulatory role, um, whether that be kind of education or health, or advertising, the state can, at least at an arm's length level, had a, an oversight role. And sport seemed to me to be something of a um, anomaly. You know, it was kind of an odd one out in that the state didn't really seem to have much of a role, although that had grown as well. So I kind of became interested in looking at well, why haven't we seen the regulation? in sports as we have in, in other kind of spheres of kind of social and, and economic life. And uh, kind of off the back of that, I included a chapter in a book I published in 2016, which looked in, in particular at the regulation of football, really kind of post uh, 1989, so kind of post Hills, but post Taylor reports and kind of looked at the development of the regulation of football over time. And then kind of from that, I've kind of broadened my interest out into various different areas. So kind of the relationship between sport and nationalism, and then more recently looking at sport and activism with a particular focus on the activism of fans and football fans in particular. Okay, okay. Um, it's interesting now you talked about the history. I almost gave a little bit of a very quick timeline of a history of sport and politics. Because one of the arguments that's always put forward is, oh, we don't like the fact that sport and politics mix and it's in front of our screens, which I have some sympathy with, to be fair. If I'm watching be, um, a boxing fight or a football match, I just want to watch that event, but um, athletes participating. I don't want to listen to um, commentators talking about the politics or, or presenters talking about the politics, etc. However, in saying that, are we a bit naive when we come to talking about that relationship in that, we always think it's never been there when in actual fact it has? Or is it something that's just crept up over the last, say, 20, 30 years? Yeah, I think I think there's a distinction to be made. So um, that kind of question of whether sport and politics should mix, I, I, I do think at a kind of a general level, that is a it is a redundant question because it, it's inevitable. Yeah. Because the only way we can we can say that they shouldn't mix is if we have a really, really limited, thin understanding of what politics is. So for lots of people, politics means 
what the government does or what the state does or does not do. And and we can have we can have a discussion about how much should governments or how much should the states get involved in any particular sports. Most people think actually um states should encourage sports, should fund sports, should have a responsibility to provide community sport. But that but leaving that to one side, if we kind of take politics at a broader level, then it's inevitable. It, it, politics and sport will always mix because sport is a part of society. So sport is not this kind of isolated sphere that we can bracket off and kind of make it impermeable to other things that happen in society. It's part of society. The individuals who participate in sport are citizens, are subject to the rules of that particular laws of that particular land and will have their own attitudes and and own issues and own grievances. So in that sense, it's it's inevitable. And I think the best way to think about it is um, sport, like most things, is relational in the sense that um, it involves relationships between people. In essence, sport is inherently relational. It's very difficult to think about how sport will function unless you think about relationships. Sport is about teams, is about clubs, is about associations. It's about configurations of people. And as soon as you get groups or configurations of people, particularly when those groups of people have to make decisions, then there's all those kind of political questions of power, of identity, of inclusion, exclusion, and they are all political questions. So that is not a new thing. It's probably just this, it's probably more a sense of, as a general populace, we are now more sensitized to some of those debates and those debates gain a little bit more traction. They gain a little bit more airtime than they perhaps did in the past. So I think on a fundamental level, they have always mixed, but certainly the commentary on those kind of political debates in sports have grown, uh, particularly, I would say, in the last decade. And even even more so the last few years, I think. Okay, so it has grown, obviously, and it's interesting. We talked. I remember the Qatar World Cup last year. And I don't yeah. know if you're aware of this, but uh, the BBC, when they were due to um, host the opening ceremony, you could still watch it on iPlayer, but yeah. on the BBC One channel instead of showing it, they had a discussion about the human rights of Qatar. And I felt that what we I really think of Qatar, um, what they are doing, I kind of felt that was a little bit too far because you go there, you, you push on the TV to watch yeah. um, opening ceremony and whatnot. And again, I'm not saying I agree with Qatar on human rights, but do you think it's almost gone too far in a sense of now, before what used to happen, you used to get protest mm-hmm. um, and feel like Black Power salute and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, again, there's this whole history of sports and politics but it's almost like you can't even enjoy a game anymore without that being brought up. At least on the field of play, there was that combative element. Okay, let's, there might be external politics around it, but at least on the field of play, we could um, at least enjoy that, but it doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Or it might be a bit too pedomistic or... <laughs> no, I think, well, there's a question about whether it's right or wrong. And I suppose politics is a bit like beauty in that, you know, it's to be found in the eye of the beholder. And that that's that's the thing now that um, people generally when people say oh sport and politics shouldn't mix generally what people what what we can translate that to is I don't want the type of politics or I don't want too much that type of politics that I am not sure about or I don't I'm not fully confident in coming into the sporting realm and that's very difficult I think it's very difficult for broadcasters for individual athletes for sports fans themselves you know I, you know I was you know personally I wasn't in favor of the Qatar World Cup but I still watched it and so you know not all of it but I was so does that make me complicit am I a supporter of that regime so there's all those kind of really difficult dilemmas political dilemmas and I don't think we should shy away and I think we can take a view, you know, we can take our, our own individual view on whether the BBC was right um, not to show the opening ceremony or not. But 
and maybe that I think the you know the broadcaster, a public broadcaster, which the BBC is doing that was probably. I, I don't know if there's another example of it taking that stance, but I suppose it was an example of a sport and boycott, and we've seen numerous sport and boycotts throughout history. So, you know, the, the probably the most famous example is the near enough wholesale sport and boycott of South Africa during the apartheid regime. And, you know, and that was that was kind of widely supported and wasn't particularly challenged at the time. And certainly is in retrospect, it certainly seemed to be a really kind of powerful part of that campaign against apartheid. And obviously you've seen, you know, countries and nations boycott particular tournaments, the, the USA in terms of uh, the 1980 uh, Olympics, for example, in the Soviet Union, as it was then. So we have seen... We have seen kind of that use of boycott before. So I don't think that in and of itself is a new thing. I think what, what, what is different about, I would say, the last five years or so, I can't remember exactly when was the Sochi Winter Olympics, was that 2014? So maybe since, yeah. Yeah, since Sochi. I think what's different now is, I think there was a kind of um, a complacency within the kind of the, the sporting associations and the sporting governing bodies, FIFA, the, the, the Olympic Committee. But there was this kind of general idea that sport was a democratising force. And even if, you know, sport might engage uh, regimes which are problematic for lots of different reasons, and that's not a new thing, you know, just because these countries are now hosting events, they, they participated in sport for a long time. Qatar's got a, you know, a much more recent sport and heritage. But there's lots of other countries who were willingly allowed to participate in sport. And I think that's been on the general assumption that sport is is good in diplomatic terms, and it, it's kind of a force for democracy. There's this kind of this idea that sport is inherently democratic, and the values of sport will help you know, democratise or liberalise countries. I think the difference now is, I think there's much less confidence in that general view that actually, well, perhaps sport is being seen to uh, be used as a kind of propaganda tool and actually, you know, the idea of sports washing masks uh, some of the, the abuses or the particular authoritarian features of, of regimes and actually is used as a way to uh, elevate that regime on a global stage. And again, that in itself is not new because we've seen that in the past. But I think in the kind of post-war context, there was this kind of general idea that that sport was a force for good. And as it kind of moved around the world and engaged different countries, it was a kind of diplomatic tool for democracy. And I think because democracy itself is kind of increasingly under threat and challenged across the globe, including in some of the kind of traditional liberal democracies, there's there's a kind of real anxiety and concern of how is sport being used and kind of you know where will it go? Um, so I, I think yeah we're li we're living in kind of more unsure, more anxious times politically again, which kind of um, kind of. The, the ripples of that reverberates out into sport and kind of the, the politics of sport as well. Okay, so you mentioned there sports washing as well. And we've seen certain events being accused of that. So you could talk about Qatar, not just with the World Cup, but with the World mm -hmm. Athletics Championships as well a few years earlier. Yeah. How, just quickly, just give a big, um, a short history on like the history of sports washing and so on. And also, do you think or like when West, West, or Western countries host events, are they sport washing as well? And what I mean by that, there seems to be a moral, especially in the UK, there seems to be a bit of a moralistic stance from the UK government when they talk about sport. Like at mm -hmm. the time of recording this, yeah. there was a, apparently the UK government are looking at the governing body of Formula One to mm. talk about the situation in Bahrain and so on and so forth. So do you think there's a lot of sports washing goes on in Western countries? And also, do you think, especially the UK government, to take too much of a uh, moralistic stance when it comes to sport and athletes in a way which they themselves would never follow? Yeah, but that that is that's kind of the the criticism that's 
kind of levels of governments that um you know we might criticize you know there, there might be particular commentators or even maybe politicians who might criticize let's say Saudi investment in Newcastle United via the PIF fund but the UK government you know willingly trades arms with Saudi Arabia which are used in the conflict with Yemen and, and how how can we reconcile those two positions and I think that's a legitimate question you know there's, there's obviously some contradictory or uh, let's say even maybe hypocritical stances taken I think that perhaps the difference, um, not to kind of explain those kind of contradictions and hypocrisies away, but perhaps the difference with sport is the kind of the emotional t- attachment that people place to it, which it, it does make it different from most other things, even most other kind of cultural pursuits. The, the, the notion of fandom and the peop- and the idea that people feel emotionally attached, you know, to a particular sport or particular athletes or a particular, you know, nation competing in that sport, a particular club, and that identification with it, the the sense that it is part of their identity, makes it, I think, a very, very powerful mechanism uh, and a mechanism of influence for kind of changing people's mindsets and views. Um, So I think there is there's the potential for legitimate argument say sport is slightly different and I say that again it doesn't kind of um it doesn't qualify all the kind of contradictions and, and the point about kind of the western um bias or the western uh kind of centric viewpoint I think that's a good one as well and I think that was kind of really that was really really evident if you in terms of the Qatar World Cup last year because uh, I was engaged in some debates and some events um, online. And although it was a major topic of conversation in the UK media and some kind of Western European media, and to a certain extent the US media, other people I spoke to who were based uh, in other parts of the world, some in Qatar itself, some in other parts of the Middle East, some in Asia, some in Latin America, it, it just wasn't a debate. It just wasn't a topic. So we are definitely susceptible, I think, in the UK and perhaps in Western Europe to thinking uh, you know, in, in a kind of a Eurocentric way that sport is ours and, you know, sports originated here and we can project out from there a little bit. And actually, there's very little engagement with what, what other people around the world think, and I don't, and I don't want to kind of make a moral, moral, morally relative point that everyone's viewpoint is, is you know, is equally valid, and, and we can't make our own moral positions on things. But I do think it's worthwhile kind of breaking out of that a little bit sometimes, and, and thinking about, oh, what does the rest of the world think about these things, and not just assuming they all think the same as us, because that is clearly it, it, it isn't it isn't the case. And you, you can kind of point about the Western government's um, sports wash. Um, that's an interesting one. I, I think all, I suppose all international events, at least in part, they're about national prestige, national pride, and projecting a particular image, you know, of the nation outwards and inwards. Um, whether we would classify that as sport washing i think that's you know it's up for the debate if you look at kind of u.s sport and kind of how nationalistic and militaristic it is um then you could argue it's certainly projecting a particular image of the country you know as say both to the its own population and outwards whether we would kind of classify that as sport washing I'm not sure, but yeah, the, 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 there's parallels there to be to be drawn. It's not as if all Western countries invest in sport and you know host sport events purely for the love of the sport itself, and there are no kind of other ulterior motives. You know, clearly there are kind of economic, cultural, but also a kind of uh, wider questions of soft power as well. So yeah, I think I think that. It, they're not 
it's not a kind of a an either or situation that the parallels to be drawn across lots of different countries and it's not just a question of kind of authoritarian or illiberal regimes okay so what role does the news media play in this because i remember back in the 90s and teenager i was I did sports science. I remember we talked about this jingoistic fervor sometimes that the news media create, especially at that time when it was to do with, say, England versus Germany or England versus Argentina. Does yeah. that happen so much now, this conflict, or do they, how do the news media interweave like the politics and sports you know, now compared to, say, 30, 40 years ago? Uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, so sport is a obviously a kind of very, very heavily mediated spectacle and it is the global spectacle so i think sport is more important um to media than it ever has been um you know you can see that in terms of the money that broadcasters are willing to to pay for the rights it, it it's not shrinking it, it, it is growing and it does seem to be in kind of insatiable appetite for sport i also think about if you think about the kind of the wider changes in media and the advent obviously of of online media that kind of uh, that the, the kind of the battle for for eyeballs if for, 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 you know for want of a better phrase you know, for people's attention you know that is at the kind of the heart of media capitalism you know, capturing people's attention and hopefully capturing their data through that and, you know, being able to sell advertisers on the back of it. That is the kind of the number one business globally. So, and sport is kind of absolutely kind of central to that. So I think that kind of relationship between sport and media is it, 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 it kind of more important, more significant than ever. The kind of question about the kind of the more that the role of the press, um, and you mentioned kind of the, particularly the English tabloid press when the English national team played Argentina and uh, and Germany, Euro 96 and World Cup 98 and before that, particularly in the 1996 game against Argentina. Yeah, there were kind of really heavy nationalistic military overtones. You know, you didn't need to be a particularly, you know, he didn't need to do any kind of critical discourse analysis. It was kind of in the headline, front and centre. I think, you know, and I'm not, I'm not analysed that change over time, but kind of my own view anecdotally is that that has reduced, that has receded a little bit. Um, yeah, without kind of having any kind of real evidence to back it up, I, I don't think that is as prevalent uh, as it as it once was. I think what, what's interesting in a British context over that time, really, if we think about kind of Euro 96 onwards, is the emergence of an English national identity. Um, and again, that is really, really central to the politics of sport because if you think about it, you know, what are the what are the kind of civic institutions of, of England, of English nationalism? Well, there's only really the English national team. There's no English, you know, there's no kind of parliament, English parliament. You know, the BBC is a British broadcaster. You know, most things are British. So the English rugby team, the English, you know, football team, they are really the expressions of Englishness. So that it's always been really, really important. And I think it's become more important. I think what, what's been interesting to witness over the last few years, while well, I've got a Southgate has, has been Eng England football manager, is he has made a concerted effort to actually articulate a more progressive, more inclusive version of Englishness, perhaps more so than anyone else. Um, so I think I think that's a really kind of interesting de development. So yeah, I think that kind of nationalistic favour has receded, thankfully, a little bit. Um, but yeah, this kind of idea of English national identity is kind of an interesting development over the last 20 or so years. Okay, so going back to a statement you made, you talked about why sport could be different. And one of the reasons you gave was this emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. So why would that make it sport different for, say, something like music? In a mm -hmm. sense, people do have an emotional attachment to uh, music, especially certain bands. Um, so what would be the difference between the two in that respect? That's a good question. I think, and, and there is... 
there is kind of studies on fan activism, which looks at the relationship between uh, the fans of particular music drummers or even particular music bands and how that influences their political thinking and political activism. I know there's a study on um, the fans of REM and kind of looking at the kind of the, the kind of political and the kind of social sociological aspects of their fandom. I think I know this. I'm biased because I look at kind of sports fans. I think one of the key differences is is that sport, particularly uh, team sport, and most of my research looks at um, football supporters. One of the big differences with that is it's rooted in a place. So often for political participation to kind of take hold, it needs a space, it needs a kind of geographical uh, entity around which to coalesce. Now, if we think about what, what are the traditional spaces, the traditional you know, places where politics took place at a grassroots level, well, Major one is, is religion. So, you know, the church or other religions are major spaces of which kind of political participation and mobilizations can happen. The workplace and the role of trade unions and kind of other kind of community and civic associations. Well, if we look at all of those, the role of all of those things has been eroded or is reduced in society as kind of part of associational life, places where people go and associate with the people and talk about politics and maybe get involved in politics. Yeah. So one of the arguments that I make with, with a, one of my fellow authors, uh, Dr. Paddy Howie, is that one of the reasons why we, we're beginning to see activism amongst football fans is that it's one of the few places that is left where people go on a regular basis and mix with other people and talk about issues they care about. So. I think that kind of rootedness in place is one of the distinguishing uh, characteristics of sport. The other one, I would say, is that unlike music, generally, it might apply to music, but much less so, is that sports and sports fandom tends to be intergenerational. Yeah. So, you know, allegiance to a particular club or the, 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 the love of a particular sport, not necessarily but has a tendency to be passed on to children or other family members or other kind of like-minded people. That can happen with music, but I think it's less well-developed. So yeah. music is seen, even when it's a kind of a collective experience, it's seen as a more, I think, a more individual uh, pursuit. There are the opportunities to those collective experiences, gigs, festivals, but not in the same way, I don't think, as sport is. Okay, so there's more of like a rights of passage. So, for example, if you're supporting a football team or a rugby team or even into boxing, like which is my sport, there's mm. almost rights of passage where the father would do it and then he, his um, sons would do that particular sport, either take them down to the game or if you're in boxing, take them down to the gym, etc. Whereas in music, there isn't really, you might like bands, but then your sons might like something different because it's yeah. something it's more of like a rite of passage in regards to... So yeah, you, so yeah, you can, you, you, you are, often people are socialised into a particular fandom or a, or a participation in sport. And those places, so you talk about, you know, the boxing club, you might take your, your son or daughter to a particular boxing club where you've been a member for a long time. and that boxing club, there will be some elements, I'm kind of talking about politics with a small p, but there will be some political context to that boxing club or a particular local football club will have a, you know, again, politics with a small p, will have a particular political context and you are socialising people into that. The other thing I think is kind of longevity is that sport, not always, but sport tends to endure and would, will endure longer than, you know, most music bands, you know, maybe Perhaps with the exception of someone like the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. you know, most music bands tend to come and go. They might have a period of 10 years, but you don't have that longevity. So that kind of rootedness as well is the sense that, you know, sport is kind of has that uh, kind of transcending quality is that it existed before me. It exists throughout my lifetime and it will exist after me. And I think that that, again, is a very kind of powerful 
uh, motivator and kind of um, kind of captures people's identity and allegiance in a way that other things perhaps don't to the same extent. Okay, so with music, if you like a music band, you're a fan, you like their band, you'll buy their music, you go to the gigs, etc. Would you say with sport, you are a fan and you enjoy going to whatever sport you like, but especially in some sports, you, you're seen as more a custodian, i.e. this is mine and I want it to be right for the next generation that I pass it down to? Hmm. Yeah, well, it, some people talk about kind of the sense of fans having moral ownership of a club or of a sport. Again, in a way, I don't think most, and I don't know the research, but I don't think most music fans think, well, um, you know, whoever it might be, I used the example of REM before, but I'm, I'm a fan of REM and I feel like I have some kind of moral ownership over the band and their artistic, you know, merits. Well, I, don't, I, I can't see that how that applies, where fans, mo in most cases, don't have any legal right, they don't have any actual ownership but they do feel they have some kind of ownership of the cultural heritage of, of I'm talking here particularly about football, of the club, because it's not just about the 11 players or even the stadium. It's that generation, those subsequent generations of fans over time, which have created that history, which have contributed to that history. So that sense of being part of it, um, and supporting it financially, but also feeling you kind of have that sense of moral ownership. Again, I think I think that kind of marks out a slightly different. Okay, so again, it's more um, guardians debate. Hmm. And is that sometimes why fans see themselves like that? Is that sometimes why there's a disconnect sometimes between the fans and the owners of the club? Because owners want it as a business, but then the fans see it as something more and basically they see the business say, okay, you're looking after it for now, but sooner or later you're going to need to sell up and have, uh, let's grow. Is that a big reason why is that disconnect? Well, yeah, well, I think, yeah, that, that in a nutshell, that, that is the why there is a, such a major kind of disjuncture, um, that there is fundamentally different views. So I think there's an idea, and this is kind of something I'm writing about at the moment, that what's called uh, kind of a famous... Uh, economic anthropologist stroke historian E.P. Thompson called model economy and is this idea that people protest when they feel that kind of some traditional customs conventions and traditions are being transgressed mm. so you could look at the, the protest around the European Super League in 2021 as an example of yeah. where something is happening and you know the fans or a significant section of fans think actually, even though this might be in, in the interests, in the, at least in the short term, commercial economic interests of their club, they think actually that this transgresses some of the kind of, you know, the red lines or, you know, the kind of the established customs and I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to kind of put up with it. And that, that caused people to be mobilized and go and, and, and protest. So I think, yeah, you know, at its heart, that that is the kind of some of the you know the big disconnects in terms of where sports is trying to head commercially, in terms of a entertainment event industry, and then the kind of traditional conventional view of um, many sports fans as you know sports for sports sake and and the kind of you know. Uh, it being about essentially the sport and competition and sport and merit. Uh, you know, and, and that's they're kind of pulling in two different directions, and that's why you're getting this kind of activism and protest emerging. Okay, so you've talked about the fans a lot. So, how has fans activism and fans and the um, fan politics and sports? How has that changed since the turn of the century? And in addition to that, mm. what's the difference between how fans behave from a political standpoint, say in a team sport, compared to an individual sport, or is there no difference? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think in terms of the broad changes, and I think the broad level changes in how sports fans act and think politically maps onto some of the broader trends in society, just about how ordinary citizens think. So, you know, one of the, if we kind of take a step back, one of the big changes in, and we'll talk about UK politics, but it applies elsewhere, but in UK politics, 
one of the big changes in UK politics over the last 70 years has been that at one point in the 1950s, people felt a strong allegiance to one of the two main parties, Labour and Conservative. And not in every case, but there was a general alignment that they voted with the party that they had allegiance to. Mm. That is hot, that is obviously reduced over time. People feel less allegiance to a particular party. People are less deferential to authority. They are less trust, trusting of authority. They don't accept what authority tells them as truth and as fact, and they don't trust them to govern, you know, in this case, the country in the interest of the public or the national interest. And the same thing we can see in sport. So at one time, sports fans were, you know, particularly from the English case, were very, very passive and very deferential. Um, the idea that you know fans would be activists in relation to their own club or their own sport you know, the own governing body was kind of anathema. It was just, it, it was very, very, very limited. So I think fans like citizens are more critical of the information that they receive. They scrutinise what those in charge do and are willing to protest against those in charge. Um, and uh, why is that? Um, I think there's a few reasons. I think the big one is the level of education in society. In general, so not that necessarily people are better educated, but they are certainly better informed. The obviously the access to information now in yeah. well, 2023 is light years away from the access of, of information to the average sports fan would have had in the 1960s, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if some, you know, if a football fan wants to criticise what the football association was doing in the 1960s, well, what what information would they have to base that on? There wasn't anything. Whereas now, there's much more information, and actually, organisations struggle to keep information secret. So that leads to scandals and crises. And as you get these kind of multiplied on top of each other, that's when you get that kind of mistrust creeping in. So you've got increasing mistrust with increasing information and increasing kind of ability to think critically, all those things I would say combine to make a less trusting, less deferential populace in general, but that also applies in sport. And, you know, that applies right down to the macro level to what happens on an individual club basis, all the way up to kind of, as we've talked about, the World Cup and the Olympics, people are not just willing to accept the face value of what is presented to them. Um, so I would say that is the kind of the big change. It's a change in society in general. Okay. So with fans activism, obviously it was a success in regards to something like the European Super League because hmm. days of English clubs saying, oh, we want to, not just English clubs or European, most European clubs saying this was going to happen. Fans are out in force, players are out in force saying, no, this can't happen. And then within, what, what three days, basically all but I think three clubs uh, went away. Yeah. But other, than that, other than that, how successful is fans' activism in regards to not just changing policy within sport, but also changing policy within a particular club? And one example I'm thinking of is, say, something like the rugby, mm. where you've had Wasp and you've had uh, Worcester. Yeah. They basically just gone out, almost gone out of business, getting relegated as a result. And yet you had strong fans there saying, we don't want this, and yet nothing really changed, and now they're suffering the consequences. So I'm just wondering how effective can fan, um, fan activism be? Yeah, well, I think that, that that's an important point to note. It's, you know, it's important not to overstate the successes of it. Um, so just because we're seeing more activism and more kind of movements within sports, doesn't mean that they're all successful, you know, of course they're not. So th th there's probably much more examples of uh, failed attem attempts to kind of really produce significant change or in those cases kind of arrest or, or, or stop what a process of events which, which was already kind of in motion. And there are obviously major financial constraints to those situations. So there's, there's lots there's lots of examples in sport where fans have mobilised and they haven't ultimately achieved their aim. But again, that's not that's not um, 
that's not particular to sports. If we look at kind of most social movements, they don't ultimately achieve what they're trying to do, but we can still see them as a an important form of activism. So we might look at kind of the Occupy social movement in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Well, it didn't achieve its ultimate aim of reforming capitalism, but it's still an important social movement. So I don't think we should necessarily read back from the outcomes and say, well, this is important or this isn't important. What I would say about maybe some other examples of which are really kind of contemporary is the change to well, the introduction of safe standing within football. So um, as people will know, post Hillsborough and post Taylor report, there was a move to uh, a requirement for all seater stadium uh, in, in a tough light in particular. And that, you know, over a kind of a period of 30 years, certain supporters, groups and activists have campaigned to have that changed and have campaigned for the introduction of standing areas, called safe standing areas. That That is successful. That, that, that is now in legislation. The other thing which is really recent following the publication of the government's white paper is the introduction of an independent regulator for football. Again, which is something which fan groups have campaigned for over decades. So they are examples of long running uh, activist campaigns, which we can see at least some partial uh, successes in. But yeah, I would accept that, you know, there are far more examples of failed attempts or unsuccessful attempts than there are of the kind of the positive examples. So I was actually going to come on to this government um, white paper that came out recently regarding football. I noticed your uh, co-founder of it, was it called a football collective? Mm -hmm. um, so just briefly, what is that? And also what are your just initial thoughts on the government white paper? Is it over-regulation? And uh, point to that, I know FIFA, they have a rule with regards to government overreach of mm -hmm. the country. So how would that, government white paper and possibly regulator affect that FIFA rule? Yeah, I think that's always been a bit of a red herring and that is kind of being used and appealed to by um, previous governments to, to maybe kind of push away or, or kick the subject of a, the instruction of independent regulation into, you know, into the long grass. I think the... the the introduction of a regulator is really about ensuring the sustainability, the financial sustainability of football. So in essence, it's trying to kind of save football from itself because the financial dynamics of football kind of have, have gotten out of control and have led to particularly kind of wage and transfer fee inflation. So the first thing is that it's primarily an economic regulator. It's an economic regulator which will have certain aspects of social regulation bolted onto it to help protect the kind of the heritage of clubs and give fans more of a voice. So kind of broadly, kind of, yeah, I, I, I'm in favour of that. I think that that is a, an important and a, and a really kind of positive uh, step in the right direction to a more first of all, more sustainable game and also a more, a small step, but important one to a more democratic uh, game. Because um, I think anything which ultimately increases the voice and the representation of fans will be of benefit, um, will be a benefit to football. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an important one. I don't think there will be any ramifications in terms of the, you know, potential for FIFA to sanction uh, UK football for kind of political inference. I think I think it's a it's a it's a misnomer. I don't think it will happen. Okay. So one area of sport that we've not really talked about when we're discussing um, the its links to um, politics is the athletes. Yeah. Now, I've already mentioned Black Power Salute. Obviously, you have people like Muhammad Ali who <clears throat> um, if we got in that regard are very political. How has that changed, particularly over the years? Are more athletes getting involved in a political sense? Is there pressure for athlete, more athletes to get involved in a political sense? Because you get sometimes get the impression that some athletes may not actually want to have a political voice, they just want to go out in there and compete as best they can. Yeah, I don't know whether 
Um, kind of the question about the kind of pressure and whether people feel compelled to. I don't know. Obviously, the, the, the vast majority of athletes choose to make no political statements. There's, there's just maybe a, a distinction to be made there with political gestures and political symbols. You know, like anything, you know, people, most of the time, people want to conform. So to to kind of make a stance and separate yourself out, that is obviously a, that bears more social costs. So someone like uh, Wilf Sahar, when he said, well, I'm not going to take the knee anymore because I don't believe it's having an impact, you know, that, that perhaps it, it, it kind of is more risky. So yet yeah, maybe there is a kind of a, a compulsion to conform with whatever the consensus view is at that time. But I think in general, I don't know whether they feel more pressure to be activists as such. Um, I think there has been definite uh, changes. I think the major one for athletes is the kind of changes in power relations, you know, particularly at the kind of the really top elite level. The relations of power between individual athletes and their teams or franchises in, in, in the US, their clubs and their associations and leagues, that is very, very different than it, than it was, you know, certainly if we're comparing them to in the 1960s to the likes of John Carlos and Tommy Smith or Muhammad Ali, but even, you know, to the 1990s, it's, it's very, very different. So it, it's an extreme example, but if we take someone like LeBron James, and, and, and this is probably the most extreme example, but it's, it's useful to kind of illustrate the point. He's obviously massively economically powerful. I think his net worth is about one point, you know, two billion. He's a very successful venture capitalist. You know, he's earned far more off the court than he has through his career. He's got his own businesses. He's got his own media company. So it would be it would be wrong and it would be reductive to say LeBron James's activism is because he's a wealthy individual. Be, you know, because there's lots of wealthy athletes and they're not all activists. But it's obviously it's an important factor because not only is he wealthy, he you know if we kind of use um, some kind of Marxist terminology for a minute, you know LeBron James, he, he's not really a you know he's not really a wage labourer. He's not relying on that team or that league to pay his salary. He owns the means of production. He has a media company. He. He determines what is put out there. So um, I think just just reading his website before, so his website is called More Than an Athlete, and it describes his mission as kind of the uninterrupted line. And so the uninterrupted line is a brand by athletes for the athletes. We empower athletes to be more than by telling their authentic stories without interruption. So now you've got in not just you know sports teams, but individual sports people. So athletes own a media companies and they can choose what they put out there. So, you know, Le- LeBron James is an extreme example of that shift in power. <clears throat> but other athletes through social media, through other platforms, they can now make unfiltered statements. That wasn't an option to a previous generation, generation of athletes. So, you know, sometimes the comparison is made between someone like LeBron James as an activist athlete, you know, in the comparison made with someone like Michael Jordan, who's seen as the corporate athlete who chose to be apolitical because of his commercial contracts. And I think you can make that comparison, but I think you compare the apples with oranges because although Jordan was very wealthy, he's not the same as LeBron James, you know, at kind of various points in their career. So I think there's definitely a change in the power dynamics. Um, there's, There's a certain group of elite athletes who are immensely powerful and in some ways you know as powerful as they an entire sport so you know LeBron James is too powerful for the NBA to kick him out the league for any activist statements he makes it you know that that is not you know they're not going to be able to disenfranchise and the way that John Smith and and, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith were in, after the 1968 Olympics, it, it's just not feasible that he's too important, he's too powerful. But yeah, I think so. I think 
there's a general shift in, in, in power of athletes in relation to their sport, which gives them um, the ability to kind of be more activist. Um, so I, th- I think that's the full explanation, but I think it's, 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 it's certainly part of it. Okay. The reason I asked the original question was because I remember... Sorry, sorry, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna ha- to have to leave in about kind of two minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, then okay, no, cool. So um, in that case, um, in regards to politics and sport, just quickly then, how do you think it will develop over the next decade or so? Is it easy to predict or will something come along that you expect? Well, yeah, I, that's really, it's really difficult to kind of speculate. Um... I don't. I don't think there's going to be less politics. I do think we're kind of living in, in some ways, kind of hyper political times. And if you're living in kind of very, very politicized times and quite polarized times, then it's inevitable that the kind of the world's spectacle is going to be caught in that, caught up in that politics. Yeah, yeah. So I think you know we're entering choppy waters. You know, from a Western point of view, we're entering kind of quite choppy waters for what the future liberal democracies are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we've seen that sport is a battleground, both geopolitically, you know, we've got a war which is which is raging now and kind of sport is invoked in that kind of geopolitical struggle. So, you know, that that's something that we haven't talked about, which is really important. And also kind of kind of the the, the idea of the culture wars and you know, things like the participation of transgender athletes, that is not going away anytime soon. That is going to be a debate and a topic for conversation for, I would say, at least the next kind of two to three decades. So, yeah, I don't think the kind of the, the politics sport is going away. And I only kind of really expect it to kind of intensify and amplify, if anything, over the next few years. Well, it's been a really interesting conversation um, and I've certainly made me think about a lot of things. Again, thank you so much for coming and discussing this uh, topic. It's been really much appreciated. Thank you. Oh, no, you're more than welcome, Chris. Uh, and as I say, if you want to uh, continue the conversation again and all those things we didn't talk about, then um, yeah, I'll be happy to talk again. Uh, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chris. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye now.